as we begin worship this morning, I want to ask you to be mindful of two things. First of all, pray for the peace of Jerusalem and the conflict that's going on in our world right now. We actually have church members that are on the ground in that area that um, we're praying for. So this is not just important, it's personal. So pray for them if you would. Keep that in your mind today. And secondly, I have sad news to report. Paul Munzer passed away early Saturday morning. Um, if you don't know who Paul is, he's the tall gentleman, Elizabeth's husband, who walked with a cane, retired uh, VA uh, orthopedic surgeon. He's only been a member of our church a little over a year. But um, you either knew Paul or you were getting ready to know Paul. <laughs> he never met a stranger, but he lost a battle with COPD that was pretty severe. So I'd ask you to be prayer, be in prayer just during the service in the days to come for Elizabeth. His service will be several weeks from now for his family to get here and make arrangements because they'll be coming in from Wisconsin. But um, I want to welcome you here and ask you to be prayerful and worshipful about your purpose this morning and what God would say to you. Um, and I hope that he speaks to you. I hope that you hear from him. Because unless the, the Lord of glory comes down and speaks, everything we do is in vain. We need to hear from God. And so um, draw into him to this morning. And I'm glad you're here at the river. Anyways, <laughs> good morning. Welcome to the river. Um, we're going to pray right now. Thank you. Father, we love you this morning. And um, as you spoke to me yesterday, the weight of the world is not your weight. It's mine. <laughs> wow. Where would that come from? Lord, you're right. <laughs> it's too much. It's too much for us, but it's not too much for God. All things are possible with him, and he loves us, and we just, Father, we thank you this morning that you are able. Your hand is not so short that you can't save. There's nothing you can't save, and there's nothing you can't make anew and fresh, and there's no one you can't protect. We love you this morning when we praise you and we worship you, our God and our King, in Jesus' name. Stand. And the Mayan Giants cry too. Stand up and bless the Lord your God from everlasting to everlasting. Blessed be your glorious name, which is exalted above all blessing and praise.
just a shepherd boy without a shield without a sword fed up with the giant's voice and screaming curses to the lord oh, i walked down that hill alone with a pocket full of river stones what that Philistine couldn't see is what I had was more than me. See, on my own I'm weak, but my God fights for me. Oh, yes, he does. So turn it around. Turn this thing around. Oh, God, turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. I'm calling on the name that changes everything. Oh, God, 
turn it around. God, turn it around. God, turn it around. It's all of my hope is in the name. Loving God, come down. Come and turn it around. Where there is grief, where there is loss, for Elizabeth and others, Lord, turn it around. Where there is war, where there is hate, where there is division, God, turn it around. Where there is illness, where there's weakness, where there's pain, Lord, turn it around. I 
Jesus, and you're holy. We just pray that you would come and turn things around. Lord, use our feet to go to places to spread the good news. Use our voices to share the hope, the faith that we have in your name to others who are lost. Lord, come. Come now. Turn it around. And use us, Lord, to further your kingdom. And Lord, may it start now with giving of our tithes, our gifts to you, a God who is worthy that you may use this, Lord, to reach those that need to hear the good news. Bless these gifts. In your holy name we pray.
John Nelson, and he was singing with his daughter, Kaylee. Beautiful. electronic device to 1 Kings chapter 19. 1 Kings chapter 19. It's right before 2 Kings. <laughs> Thought I'd help you out there. If you are in 3 Kings, you have a really bad Bible. You might want to consider replacing that. Somebody say amen if you found it. Amen. Good. 1 Kings 19 is the record of Elijah running from Jezebel. What's interesting about this text and his fear of Queen Jezebel is in the previous chapter, in chapter 18, is when the prophet Elijah took on the 400 prophets of Baal. And really conquered them victoriously to the point of them praying and weeping and yelling out to their God, Baal. And he was even, Elijah, sarcastic and even to the point of arrogant and cocky, saying, yell louder, perhaps he's asleep. But the prayer and the powerful prayers of Elijah who made it rain after it didn't rain for three years, who prayed fire from heaven to lick up the altar and burn up every thing, even the stones and the water and the sacrifice, and then to actually put to death 400 prophets of Baal. In the very next chapter, in this very next thing that happens in his life, after having such a victorious stand for Yahweh on Mount Carmel, he runs in fear, in fear of his life after the threat, the death threat upon his life from Queen Jezebel. You know, I've never met anybody named Jezebel. It's one of those names in the Bible that you probably is not real popular. I've met a few Elijahs, but never a Jezebel, never an Ahab. So let's read this text together. And then look at about four things that will tell us about his meltdown and how God responded to it. In 1 Kings chapter 19, beginning in verse 1, Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah saying, so may the gods do to me and more also if, it, if I do not make your life as the life of one of them by this time tomorrow. In other words, she said within 24 hours, you're going to be dead. I, I, we're going to take your life. It was a death threat that lasted a day. Well, verse 3, after all that he had seen God do on his behalf, the scripture says, then he was afraid. He goes on to tell us, he arose and ran for his life and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness and came and sat down under a broom tree. And he asked that he might die, saying, it is enough, O Lord. Take away my life, for I'm no better than my father's. And he lay down and slept under a broom tree. And behold, the angel touched him and said to him, Arise and eat. And he looked and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on hot stones and a jar of water. And he ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of the Lord came again a second time. Even God believes in snooze buttons. Amen. 
Arise and eat, for the journey is too great for you. And he arose, and he ate and drank, and went into the strength of that food 40 days and 40 nights to Horeb, the mount of God. And there he came to a cave and lodged in, and behold, the word of the Lord came to him and said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? God often speaks to us with questions. And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And I, even I only, am left. And they seek my life to take it away. And he said, go out and stand on the mount before the Lord, and behold, the Lord passed by in a great strong wind, tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake. But the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire. But the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire, the sound of a low whisper. In some translations, it says a still, small voice. And when Elijah heard it, he wrapped his face in his cloak, and he went out and stood at the entrance of the cave. And behold, there came a voice to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? And he said, I've been very jealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, for the people of Israel, broken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and killed your prophets with the sword. And even I only am left, and they seek my life too to take it away. And the Lord said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. And when you arrive, you shall anoint Hazel to be king over Syria. And Jehu, the son of Nimshi, you shall anoint to be king over Israel. And Elisha, the son of Shaphat, and Abel Meloeb. And you shall anoint him to be prophet in your place. Verse 17. And the one who escapes from the sword of Haziel shall Jehu put to death. And the one who escapes from the sword of Jehu shall Elijah put to death. Yet I will leave 7,000 in Israel, all the knees that have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth that has not kissed him. I don't know about you, but it seems like we are living in a day where people, even the people of God, perhaps even some of you, are afraid of everything but God. We get afraid of our circumstances and our situations. We get afraid of the loss of income or losing a job, or we get afraid of, of health issues. We get afraid of broken relationship issues. The list just goes on and on and on. But what happened to the fear of God? In the midst of Elijah's victory, he has a meltdown at the, even just the threat, the words of Elijah. Nothing had even happened yet. Just word came to him that she was going to take his life. So this message is about his fear that turns into his despair, asking the Lord, take my life. I've had enough, God. I'm the only one left. Well, that's what he thought. But God had different plans. So let me talk to you a couple of things about, about, about four things that I think we need to glean out of this text. And the first one in your outline is this. Elijah's fear caused him to flee to the wilderness. Fear will make you run. Fear will make you avoid situations and people. Fear will make you say things and do things that you regret and you never would do if you weren't afraid. Fear is a very real emotion, but fear run wild can really make you have a very clouded perspective. In the midst of Elijah's fear, when he learned that Ahab had told Jezebel, the king had told the queen, all they had done, it took out 
her special forces, the 400 prophets of Baal, and killed them all, and he wiped out Baal worship from all the prophets, basically, and he showed the power of God in standing up to false pagan religion. Right after that great victory in chapter 18 on Mount Carmel, he has a meltdown into fear. That ought to tell us something. Ahab had told Jezebel all that he had done, and she said, hey, so, I, I, it, so, so it, 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 uh, in all the gods before me, in other words, in the name of all the gods that I believe in, I'm going to take your life within 24 hours. That was the threat that Jezebel put out by her servant on the life of Elijah. And when Elijah saw that, the Bible says he became afraid and he ran to Beersheba. He slapped it in B for boogie and he got out of Dodge. He was scared. But secondly, you need to look at their text and see that Elijah's fear not only caused him to flee, but his fear led to despair. After, after running for a day into the wilderness, he finally, probably from sheer exhaustion, sat down under the broom tree in verse 4. It says that he, he asked the Lord, take my life, uh, let me die. Enough is enough, Lord, take my life, for I'm no better than my father's. He said, I, I, I've had enough. That's not fear, that's despair. That, that's pure, the depths of depression. He got so far in, the, in that day's journey that I, I'm imagining that in his mind, he, he, he played the tape over and over and over, listening to the wrong voice of fear. You ever done that? You, you, ever, you ever got a dialogue stuck in your brain that you repeat over and over and over that's the wrong message that you don't need to hear? It's the message that, that sends you further into the thing that you're trying to avoid? And that's what happened to him. And he just kept going over and over in his mind. And, and that's what was happening. I, I believe that, that he finally got to the point where he, he just sat down in exhaustion and said, I've had enough, God. I'm the last one. Take my life. Just let me die. Thankfully, God didn't answer that prayer. I don't know about you. I'm thankful that God didn't answer some of the ridiculous prayers that I've prayed over the years. Aren't you? Aren't you glad God said no to many things you lifted up to heaven? Aren't you glad that God said, are you kidding me? I, I can imagine if, if, if that when he was caught up into heaven, he probably smiled and thought back on this prayer and he said, boy, I'm really glad you didn't answer that one, Lord. My, I wasn't in the right place. And, and sometimes we, we need to receive a no from God. Because sometimes we ask amiss, as the Bible tells us. Amen? Sometimes we ask for the wrong motive. Sometimes we ask because we're in the, we're in the middle of a pity party and we can't see the, the perspective. And we, we're praying wrong because our hearts are wrong. And, and you're talking to God out of your, your fear or your depression or your despair and I'm very glad that God doesn't answer ridiculous prayers. I had to come up with another word for S-T-U-P-I-D because I was told that we don't use that word in our house by a four-year-old. I've, I've been trying real hard not to say that. So ridiculous is my new word. Is that okay? Y'all know what it means. Okay. He said, it's enough. God, I've had enough. Think about this for a moment. Perhaps Elijah had, had especially hoped that the events on Mount Carmel would, would turn everything around. That, that, that Jezebel would repent, that Ahab would repent, that the whole nation would, would come back under the, the power of God and worship Yahweh. And yet, even that didn't turn it around. Even that great victory. And Elijah was thinking, what else could we possibly do than that? To turn the nation and turn the queen and the king back to you. It's not enough, God. I've done. I've had enough. But God had something more in store for him. 
So it was so with Elijah that he was on the, the Mount of Horeb, that he got a revelation from God, that, that, that he had more time, that he had more to enjoy from the Lord, that, that, that he had more communion with God, that he had, had more to come as an assignment from God, that, that the last days with the Lord might be peaceful and sweet. Can I put it to you this way? Even when we get to the point to say, well, enough is enough, God take my life, only God should decide when enough is enough. And Elijah was not right in his mind and his heart because he was spiritually disoriented. See, you can, be, you can be disoriented from God and say all the right things and do all the right things and still not know what God is trying to do in your life. It's called being disoriented. It's kind of like being in a dark room and, and, and you're feeling your way around and you don't know where things are because you're disoriented. Elijah needed to be corrected in his heart and mind. He didn't need this prayer answered, God, take my life. He, he, he looked at this great victory as something that he thought was going to turn the nation around. But he ultimately, because of Jezebel's threat, he ended up looking at his work as a complete and total failure before God. And instinctively, he blamed his own unworthiness. And it was because he was a sinner that the rest of the ancestors seemed to kind of fall in that same trail and they failed too. He said, I'm the only one left. Everyone else has burned your altars. They've killed your prophets. No one is here. God, take my life too. That would have been the end of God's plan of redemption if that were true. But he was disoriented. He didn't understand that God had a plan, that God was doing something that he didn't even see. So God then for, therefore responds to Elijah, number three. God responded to the despairing Elijah in three ways. Number one, he responded to his physical needs. He baked him a cake, gave him some water, told him to get up and eat. Every, every, listen, listen, sometimes the most spiritual thing you need is to have physical refreshment. I had someone tell me when, when I was in early in my ministry, as a matter of fact, his name was Archibald Hart, a phenomenal Christian psychologist who said, sometimes the best thing you need spiritually is a nap. Because you run on adrenaline, you get so worn out, and, and, and your body gets all geared up, and that, that adrenaline just pumps you up, and you get all excited, and then you crash, and you need rest. I used to take Mondays off as a day off during the week because I would preach on Sundays. For 16 years, I preached on Sunday mornings and Sunday nights, and, and I was just exhausted on on Mondays, and I was just so irritable and grumpy because when you get high on adrenaline and your body comes down from that, you get grumpy and irritable and exhausted, and you're not real fun to be around. Just ask my wife. Amen. Mondays were bad days for pastors because they have this great day, and not a, they run on that high of adrenaline, and then they crash, and, and the, the number one thing they need is rest. I mean, I think Sunday afternoon naps are sanctified. I sometimes go home and I'll have lunch and I'll, I'll, I'll lay down or sit in the, in the chair. Sometimes I don't wake up till 7 o'clock. I mean, literally, my body says, you've had enough. Elijah, he had had enough, but he didn't know it. He thought he'd had enough spiritually. He thought he had enough in his career. But God knew what he needed. He had had enough physically. And he needed rest, and he needed to be fed, and he needed physical nourishment. So he slept under the broom tree. An angel woke him up and said, hey, get up and eat. Uh, listen, God first ministered to Elijah's physical needs. And it's not always in that order, but physical needs are important. And, and sometimes it's the most spiritual thing you can do. Because you may be operating on empty. You may be, be operating on adrenaline. And you may just need uh, uh, some rest so that you can have some perspective and to be replenished. So he ate and he laid down and took a 
it must have been Sunday because he took a nap. <laughs> Again, the angel woke up and said, Arise, get up, you need strength for the journey. And God sent Elijah on a 200-mile, 40-day journey to Mount Horeb. Now, I want you all to think about that for a moment. Now, if you and I were going on a 40-day journey, a 200-mile, a, a 40-day 40, a 40 journey, we would just laugh at that because we could just hop in the car and be there in a couple hours. It's 200 miles. I mean, come on. But he didn't have a Chevrolet pickup truck. Oh, I heard that. <laughs> he, he, he was getting ready to take a 200-mile, 40-day walk with God. And, and, and God strengthened him. And the Scripture says that that meal was enough for the journey. Man, that must have been a good cake. Amen? <laughs> God allowed, allowed <laughs> angel food cake. God allowed the prophet to recover from his spiritual despair. And, and one of the problems with you and I in our, in our spiritual journeys is that we're never forced to take time to, to get anywhere or do anything. We don't have to take 40 days to go somewhere. We, we can go to the airport this afternoon and be halfway around the world in a matter of hours. Taking a 40-day walk has a way of changing your perspective. I would imagine. And so God ministered to his physical needs. But God also allowed, by asking him, what are you doing, Elijah? I want you to think about what are you doing? God allowed Elijah to vent his frustrations. He just allowed him to speak in verses 9 and 10. He came to the cave, and he says, hey, what are you doing? And, and Elijah says, listen, I have been zealous for the Lord, the God of hosts, and, and the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant. They tore down your altars. They killed your prophets and swords, and I alone am left, and, and they seek to take my life too. I mean, I don't know about you, but that's frustration. That fear and that despair led to complete and total frustration. He wasn't seeing things clearly. Fear has a way of clouding your perspective. That's exactly what had happened. I am alone. I am the only one left. Take my life. Just, 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 I, I, there's no point in living. He was a pastor without a congregation. He was a prophet without a people. That's how he saw himself. But strangely, the reasons that Elijah provided were actually important reasons for him to remain alive. If he really was the last prophet or the last believer, the last follower of God, shouldn't he not seek to stay alive as long as possible? Shouldn't he not seek to, to, to spread the word and, to, and to, to, to see thy kingdom come? And if the enemies of God like Jezebel wanted him dead, should he not seek to defeat that wickedness? Elijah here was powerfully showed the irrational and ir uh, uh, unreasonable nature of unbelief and fear. Fear is always coupled with unbelief because the opposite of fear is faith. Faith is coupled with belief. Fear is coupled with unbelief. You can take that to the bank every single time. And that's what he was proclaiming. He was proclaiming unbelief because fear will make you think and say ridiculous things. Now, I said the word ridiculous, but I meant the other word. The one I'm not supposed to say. Finally, God not only ministers his physical needs, and God not only lets him vent his frustration, God finally says, okay, Elijah, I'm going to show you what's really going on here. And he reveals himself. He reveals himself in verse 11 and 12. He says, go out and stand on the mountain before the Lord. And behold, the Lord passed by in a great and strong wind into the mountains. And he broke the rocks into pieces before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. And after the wind, an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And after the earthquake, a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. 
But then God spoke to him in a small, still voice. God knew what the depressed and discouraged Elijah needed. Elijah needed a personal encounter with God. But Elijah's perspective was so messed up that he, he thought he needed another Mount Carmel experience. He thought he needed some phenomenal, miraculous event. But he didn't. He didn't need the wind. He didn't need an earthquake, and he didn't need the fire. He needed to hear from God. And, and, and there was nothing fundamentally wrong with Elijah's theology, but, but, but by this time, there was something lacking in his experience. He still knew God. He still knew of God and all about him. He didn't need a, a, a miraculous, phenomenal experience. He just needed a personal encounter with God. So the Lord passed him by, and, and, he, and, and God brought his presence before Elijah. But first of all, God wanted to show Elijah what he was not. He was not in the wind. He was not in the earthquake. He was not in the fire. You see, like, like many others, Elijah had, had looked for God in the dramatic manifestations. Something, you know big, something newsworthy, something miraculous, something phenomenal. But God doesn't always appear that way. I've heard people tell me, I just need a sign from God. I just need to feel it. I need, they're, they're basically saying, I need, a, I need the wind, I need the fire, I need the earthquake, I need something to move me. Whatever happened to not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. So many people have made the mistake of waiting for God to show them some type of, 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 of appalling sign in order to move them to obedience. Listen, church, you don't need a sign to obey the Lord. You just need to obey the Lord. If you know what is right, to obey God, don't wait for the sign, just obey God. Obey what God is saying, obey what God is doing. Don't wait till you feel it, don't wait till the earth splits and something happens. When I got saved, I've said this story hundreds of times. When, when, when I prayed to receive Christ into my life on October 21st, 1984, I, I believe that when I opened my eyes that the carpet in my room was going to split open like like the Red Sea and Cecil B. DeMille's The Ten Commandments. I believe, I believe things were going to fly around the room like, like poltergeist or something. I, I believe something miraculous was going to happen. Like, I trusted the Lord, and I opened my eyes, and nothing was there. But I kid you not, I heard a small, still voice in my soul saying, you're all right now. You're all right now. I've got you. God spoke to me in the gentle whisper that I needed to hear. So don't wait for him to yell at you. Listen, you can run around in that 10-acre field out there all you want. Just run around in circles. We'll all just sit back and say, have you had enough? There's some people that, that their, their perspective is so messed up that, that God could come out in the middle of that 10-acre field and yell at you and you wouldn't hear him. Because you're waiting for an earthquake, wind, or fire. And all you need to do is get along with God and listen to that, st that small, still voice. Everybody all right out there? That's what God was teaching Elijah. Elijah had, 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 had gotten too bent in his perspective and too disoriented to God of, of, because of the Mount Carmel experience. Listen, don't base your current day on a past experience. That's what Elijah was making the mistake of. He was like, well, God's going to have to recreate something bigger than the last one. That's not how God is. God doesn't do it that way. And just because he speaks to some person that way, and, and, and by the way, there's a lot of TV preachers and Internet preachers that say God did a lot of stuff that God had nothing to do with. There's a lot of 
mumbo jumbo going on out there. But I'm here to tell you this, this, this phenomenon that we look for, like a Mount Carmel experience or, or the wind and the earthquake and the fire, they're drastically different than the way God speaks. And God actually met Elijah in the quiet of a whisper voice instead of an earth-shaking phenomenon that he had done before. This small, still voice has been called by some a gentle whisper. Listen, you won't hear that if you're waiting for the resounding gong of something loud. Sometimes you just need to get quiet before the Lord and allow God to speak to your soul. And I believe Elijah thought that, that because of the dramatic display on Mount Carmel, that it was going to turn the nation around. Or perhaps he thought because of the radical display that, that God was going to bring judgment against the priest and, and of Baal, and he was going to vindicate his work and his career with, with Ahab and, and Jezebel. And neither of those things happened. The, this example is important for Christian ministers today. I've had to take a, a quick look at myself. Actually, it's been a long look, not quick. It's been a deep introspective look because as a preacher, sometimes we have in our minds that we're going to preach a message and everybody in the whole congregation will get saved all at once. Even those that are already saved, they're going to get saved again. <laughs> Miracles going to happen. I mean, and, 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 and everybody's going to repent, and everybody's going to get right, and then nothing happens, and the altar's bare. And sometimes we feel defeated. And sometimes we just pour our hearts into a message, and, and, and we preach, and we preach, and, and then nothing happens. That's when I need the small, still voice of God to speak to me and say, you've been faithful to preach it. You've been faithful to share it. You've been faithful to proclaim it. The response is not your responsibility. The proclamation is. And I've needed to hear that about a million times in my career. Because we have this expectation that's always painted different in our minds. We have, a, we have an expectation of a powerful move of God or a, 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 an incredible display of God's judgment and then mercy and grace. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said it this way, because the success of Carmel melted like the morning mist, he thought that his career had been a failure all along and that he had brought no one to reverence Jehovah. But he was reading with the eyes of unbelief. And his imagination was leading him rather than the facts of the case. Boy, that's what fear will do. You're, it'll make your imagination be your leader. Because God had told Elijah, remember, there's 7,000 who've not bowed their knee or kissed the idol. Spurgeon goes on to say, there's 7,000 people scattered up and down the country to whom God has blessed with Elijah's testimony. If he had not blessed his big things as he had desired, yet his little things, he had prospered greatly. Spurgeon goes on to end with this. It was Elijah's daily conduct rather than the miracles which had impressed the 7,000 and led them, led them to hold fast to their integrity. It's not always going to be something miraculous. Elijah had lost sight how he had lived for God, had been faithful for God, how his daily testimony had changed. He thought he was the only one still faithful to God. He had a congregation of 7,000 scattered up and down the land. And he didn't even know it. So God encourages him with that. And then he said, hey, I got one more thing for you to do. So in number four, God gives Elijah another assignment. Actually, it's probably his last assignment. He, he tells him, 
here's what I want you to do. He said, I want you to anoint Haziel, Jehu, and Elisha. God speaks to him and tells him exactly what to do. It tells him to go his way, anoint these. Basically, do you know who these were going to be? They were going to be the replacements of Jezebel and Ahab. They were going to take their place. And Elisha was going to take the place of Elijah. But there's something interesting that happened here. The scripture says in verse 13 that Elijah heard, when, when Elijah heard that small still whisper, when Elijah heard what God spoke, he wrapped his face in his cloak. In some translation it says he wrapped his face in his mantle. And he stood at the entrance of the cave. And then God gave him his assignment. He wrapped his face in his mantle and stood in the entrance of the cave. Immediately, God, Elijah sensed that God was present in the small, still voice. You know what he was saying? He was not present in the wind. He was not present in the earthquake. He was not present in the fire. Elijah had no response to that. But when Elijah heard God speak in the small, still voice, he wrapped his face in the mantle. And what he was saying was he was humbling himself. He was wrapping his face. And what he was saying was, I'm a sinner and I'm repenting. He was wrapping his face before a holy God saying, I'm guilty and I have no defense. As the old song goes, I am a sinner condemned unclean. He was confessing his sin before God through the act of, of wrapping his face as a mantle, as, as, a, as a plea. You see, if, if you go to the courts in our land and you plead guilty, you're punished. But if you go to God's courts and plead guilty, you're forgiven. Everybody get that? See, God's economy is not our economy. If you go to the courthouse under a conviction and plead guilty, you're going to be sentenced. But if you go before God and plead guilty, you're going to be forgiven. Elijah was forgiven and all things were made right. I, I, I believe in that moment that he wrapped the mantle around his face, that fear began to disappear and just began to erode and just wipe away like a mist in the morning. Listen, folks, wrap your face. Wrap your face, man. Wrap your face, woman. Wrap your face, teenager. Go before a holy God and admit that you're a sinner. Admit that we're guilty before his presence. That is our only response that we can, we can have in front of a holy God. We can't make excuses. We can't say we're the last one. We can't say to God, God, I'm done. Just take me out. No, we go before a holy God and we listen to him and we wrap our face in repentance before a holy God so that times of refreshing may come. That's what repentance does. For too long, God's people have been holding their head high in their own imaginations. We need to face reality and hang our heads low before the holy God and wrap our face in repentance and say, God, it's all about you. It's not about me. That's what Elijah was saying in that moment. He was saying, God, I recognize that I let my fear get the best of me. God, I recognize that I've been listening to my imagination. God, I recognize that it led me into despair. God, I recognize. He even vented his frustration before the Lord. Listen, God can take it. If you've got to vent, vent before the Lord. He can take it. Listen, Elijah's not the only one that poured his heart out before the Lord in frustration. I love the fact that Elijah was a mighty man of God in one chapter. In the next chapter, he's just like me and you. Everybody all right out there? 
it, he vents his frustration before the Lord, and he comes before God in repentance, and he wrapped his mantle, and that's exactly what you and I to do. And finally, God says one more time, what are you doing, Elijah? What are you doing here? I think it's a, a helpful question and answer process. God gave Elijah something to do. Sometimes in your despair, friend, you need something to do. Because if you don't have something to do, you'll focus and dwell on and overanalyze and over and repeat and play the dialogue over and over and over in your head to the point where the fear can turn into despair and despair can turn into frustration and, and, and depression and that can turn into to self-destruction. It's a downward spiral. And sometimes you just need something to do. And God saw that in Elijah and said, listen, I'm going to give you a, I'm going to give you a new assignment. Elijah's thinking, he's not done with me yet. Could I say to you, church, that God is not done with you yet? He still has an assignment for every one of us. But you'll never know it if you only focus on your fear or your despair or your own little pity party. Sometimes we need to wrap our face in a mantle and fall before a holy God and say, I'm a sinner condemned and unclean. Oh, God, forgive me. It's not about me. It's about you. Speak to me, Lord. It might take you 40 days to hear him. But Elijah heard him. You know, some scholars say that when he went to Mount Horeb, that's Mount Sinai. What happened on Mount Sinai that we looked at last week? That's the same location where Moses received the Ten Commandments from God himself. As a matter of fact... The word for cave that he went into up there is actually a word for cleft in the rock. Could it be the same spot where Moses hid before God when God passed by? Could it be that God took Elijah to that same holy location and says, listen to what I have to say? Sometimes we just need to hide ourselves in the cleft of the rock, folks to get alone with God, to hear from him. Elijah needed it. We need it. He, he dwelt on the failure of his ministry, which wasn't a failure at all. But that's how he saw it. He, he dwelt on the, 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 the imagination of him being the only one left because that's the way he felt. He was incredibly lonely because he thought he was the last faithful servant of God, and he wasn't. He just thought he was. And, and, and he focused on, on all that his old, the, the, the people had done until he repented. And he hid him in the cleft of the rock until the Lord passed by. And perhaps that's what God wants to do for us as he did for Elijah. Perhaps you've been kind of in a wandering uh, 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 path. Moses wandered for 40 years before God spoke in the cleft of the rock. Elijah wandered for 40 days before God spoke in the rock. You and I are so impatient with God, we won't wait 40 minutes until God speaks. We're so, we're so affected by our pragmatism that we won't allow God to take time with us, to mold us and shape us and, and, and put us in the place we need to be. We're, we're so accustomed to putting our debit card in, and getting our cash out. We're so accustomed to ordering our food, showing the code, and it being ready in a bag. You don't even have to slow down your car anymore to go through a drive through You just hold your hand out and grab it. It's incredible. I've done it once or twice. I can imagine that, think about, think about how, how Elijah felt on that 40-day journey to the mount think about how what he was what he was uh, just 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 over playing in his mind over and over again and yet now he was getting ready to 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 go back 
after being forgiven and cleansed and having a new assignment to, to anoint these three that are going to lead the kingdom into prosperity and faithfulness. I, I think his, his woe is me journey on the way probably looked like he was so sad. He was barely able to put one foot in front of another. He, he was probably over in his mind singing gloom, despair, and agony of me. Oh, deep, dark depression, excessive misery. If it were for bad luck, God, I'd have no luck at all. Gloom, despair, and agony over me. Some of y'all are telling how old you are. <laughs> I watched that Hee Haw song last night and just howled. Laughing, just howling. Elijah had come a long way. He was terrified. He was distressed. But now he's going back a different man. Now he's going back with confidence, with victory. He's got pep in his step. He's no longer dragging his rear. He's ready for a fight. He's been given an assignment for God. Anoint these three. They're going to weed out these evil and bring our people to faithfulness once again. And God assures him, I bet you he wasn't afraid of Jezebel no more. Elijah needed that spiritual retreat on the mountain. Amen? Anoint these, anoint these three. Anoint the ones that are going to sit on the throne. And if someone kills them, uh, 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 he tells them, hey, don't worry about it. If someone takes out Haziel, Jehu's going to step in. If someone takes out Jehu, Elijah's going to step in. I got you covered three ways to Sunday, Elijah. Don't worry about my people. I know what I'm doing. I'm God and you're not. That's what he was saying. When are we ever going to just learn to trust God? Rather than lean into the fear. Let it lead us to despair. And even to depression. And perhaps even self-destruction. That's where, that's where Elijah was headed. But God intervened and said. You need to take a little 40 day walk. And get some perspective. Come here let me talk to you boy. That's what he did. And this showed Elijah that his quiet ministry over the years was a spectacular ministry, not what happened on Mount Carmel. God revealed as he spoke to him, it's been your daily testimony and your consistency and faithfulness that 7,000 of my people have stood up and said, we will not bow to Baal. Elijah had a congregation of 7,000 people he had never met. Man, I wouldn't mind finding that out one day. Wouldn't that be amazing? Elijah probably went, really? So I'm not the last one? So all that I've done has been meant for some good? God's been going, hey, I can do a lot more with you than you can do yourself. Hey, little is much when God is in it. Amen, church? You never know how many people might be reached because of your testimony. Elijah didn't know, but God told him, and he found out. And yet we need to understand something. All the while the, when idolatry was spreading in Israel, there were 7,000 worshiping the one true God who remained faithful souls. And though Elijah didn't know it, he was not the only one left. How were they one to Jehovah? It was because of not what happened on Mount Carmel. Not because of one great sermon. Not because of one great victory. It was because of the small, still voice that the people of God have been hearing about the faithfulness of God himself through Elijah over the years. I'm telling you, God can do more than we could ever think, ask, or imagine. And that's what he did here. So let me apply it this way. Three things I want to show you this morning as we wrap this up. Has this been good? Have y'all like this? 
Listen, God can take a meltdown of fear and turn it into faith in, in a matter of moments. But I think he took 40 days to teach us something here that we need to allow God to have some time. Number one, we need to understand something. It seems that in this day that we live, we fear everything but God. We fear what other people are going to say or think about us. We, we fear what our family might say or think about us. We try to justify our actions. We try to, we try to uh, cover up our failures. We're so afraid people might find out the truth. Listen, God already knows the truth and he still loves you. Get with him and get things right. Our perspective should not be led by our imagination. Our faith should be founded on God and God alone. Not on the vain imaginations of, of our flesh. If you allow your flesh to run wild, I'm going to tell you it'll run you into a ditch. Secondly, God will decide when your assignments are over. So don't let fear decide for you. Well, I'm afraid I can't, I can't do that. I'm, I'm afraid I, I'm too old. I'm afraid I'm too young. I'm afraid I'm too busy. I'm afraid I got too much of this. I'm afraid I don't have enough of that. Listen, when God gives you assignment, you just complete the assignment. Don't come up with excuses. We should have learned that from Moses. Moses came up with every excuse in the book. And God said, I'm still going to use you. You got any more? He, he, God answered him and said, oh, well, we'll take care of that. We'll take care of that. We'll take care of that. What's next? Finally, Moses was out of excuses. And went, okay, well, I guess I'll, I'll do what you called me to do. What you lack, God doesn't lack. Everybody all right? God will make up the difference in any of our shortcomings. God has it all, and he will do it all. And we should never let fear take us out of the game. There's always places to serve. Our age or our, our inability or, or the things we focus on, even in our own imagination. You'd be surprised what you could do for the Lord in his kingdom if you would stop making excuses that are led by your fear. Fear is the opposite of faith. Thirdly, Somebody said this, I can't claim credit for number three. The author is unknown. So I printed unknown author in your, your bulletin. But here's what someone said. And so many people have repeated it. They don't know who said it to begin with. I wish I could take credit for this statement. But it's simply this. Fear knocked at the door. Faith answered. And no one was there. Our faith will drive fear away. Come on, church. That's what faith does. So can we just say, what's this sermon about? It's about God. It's not about you. Fear not, people of God. My Bible tells me that our God fights for us. And he will do what we cannot do. And our God will be victorious. His kingdom has no end. And if our God will fight for us, who can be against us? Who can take God on? Who can defeat God? No one. No army on earth. No man, no woman. No one can stand against God Almighty. Hallelujah to the Lamb who was slain, who was and is and is to come. That is our King. So blessing and honor, and power, and strength, and glory be to his name. Father, have your way in our lives today. Drive out fear, despair, depression, anger, anxiety, whatever's getting in the way. Hide us in the cleft of the rock and speak to us, Lord. May, may, our, may our distractions that come from even our own imaginations be, be washed away. So that we might hear the, the still, small voice of God in a gentle whisper. 
Speak to us again, O Lord. Give us an assignment, O God. Help us realize that Christianity is not a spectator sport. It is a participator game. And Father, give us all the heart to participate, to get in the game, to serve you, to make you known. Father, have your will and your way in God's people, we ask. In Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen. Would you stand together and worship the King of kings and the Lord of lords? Would you give him glory this morning as we worship our King? Amen.
my mouth, work through my hands, walk through my feet, and love through my heart. All that I have.